to get up and try to preach after a funeral dirge, don't you? That's good, good singing. All right, turn to the book of Matthew with me, chapter number one, Gospel of Matthew, the publican, Levi. Matthew chapter number one, verse number 18. Matthew chapter number one, verse number 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. See the wording? Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Father, bless your holy word now. In thy name I pray, amen. The word of God. Well, I don't believe in the virgin birth, preacher. It is a biological impossibility. Don't you think it's a big deal to raise somebody from the dead? If God can raise the dead, he can certainly bring forth a virgin birth. Amen. Sure, it's a biological impossibility. But the Almighty lives in a realm that is above possibilities. He's able to do anything above and beyond all that we could ask or think. I have no problem whatsoever believing in the virgin birth. Begotten of the Holy Ghost. The Lord Jesus Christ had no earthly father. God Almighty was his father when he was born 2,000 years ago. The angel is Gabriel and he calls to her attention why he came. Verse number 21. She shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. In Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 11. Thou brought forth a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Of all the things that the Lord Jesus Christ is known for, and there are many, Savior is the one that cost him the most, because he had to lay down his life to become your Savior. And note carefully, when he named him Jesus, he gave him a name that will be above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that he's Lord, to the glory of God the Father. His name means Jehovah saves. In other words, that invisible, almighty, eternal, absolute being that cannot be known save by the Son, his name shall be called Jesus. So therefore he is the Savior of all mankind. Amen. Verse number 21, it note carefully, he shall save his people from their sins. It doesn't say he's going to save them from their Roman oppressors. He's not going to save them from their poverty. He's not going to save them from their afflictions. He's going to save them from their sins. Everything else is incidental as it relates to that because number one in the mind of God is your spiritual relationship with the Lord. Now he can certainly bring you out of poverty. He can heal your body. He can certainly remove the, the uh, whatever form of government that you're under and get you under another one. He can do all these things. But God is first of all and absolutely concerned about the salvation of your soul. For 2,000 years, my dear friend, Christian ministers and Christians and the believers in Christ have been preaching and teaching and ministering and trying to do their dead level best to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. For He is the only way. I'm glad I know Him this morning. Every year at this time, people get all worked up at this feast of lights in the mid of winter and they exchange gifts and play songs and have parties and get drunk and go through all of the stuff that they go through once a year 
on the yearly cycle and it happens and it happens and it happens. But Christians stand back and they look at all of this and they say to themselves that I know Christ came into this world to seek and save that which is lost. And you never get caught up, you never get lost, you never lose your sight of what it's really about. It's not about gifts, it's about Christ who is the greatest gift of all. So the Bible said He's going to save His people from their sins. How's He going to do that? In 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 18, look carefully at what it says. 1 Peter chapter number 1 verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. In plain words, he's going to save people because he pays for their sin debt. He pays the penalty of sin. So I just said when a preacher, when a man goes to hell, he goes down there and he pays for his sin. You don't have enough to pay for it. You don't have anything to pay for it. You can never conjure up enough to pay for your sins. There's nothing a human being could possibly have to pay for his sins. It took the precious blood of Christ, who is a lamb without blemish, to pay for your sins. And when somebody says that they can pay for their sins or that something will pay for their sins, you're casting that in the face of the Son of God and saying that what He did is not enough for your sins to be cleansed and paid for. So how's He going to save you? In Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 26, He says this, Romans three twenty-six. Therefore, if the uncircumcised, Romans 3.26, I'm in the wrong chapter, here we go. Romans 3.26, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. In plainer words, he made it possible for God to justify the sinner. That's a big deal. Because how could God send some to hell and save others? What basis does He have to judge some and then not judge others? So how can we be just? How can God be a just God? And the way He does that is to take all of the sin debt, all of the guilt and condemnation, and put it on the Lamb of God. And then therefore it's been paid for and God's justice and righteousness is satisfied. And so therefore He is just if you will accept what He did for you and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, He is not just to forgive the sinner because sin is an affront and abomination to God. And here's the third thing that He does. How does He save you? Colossians chapter number 2 and verse 15. In Colossians chapter number 2 and verse 15, the Bible said, Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He broke the power of sin over our lives. Notice carefully in verse number 15, Having spoiled. That word spoiled literally means to divest wholly of its power and connection to you. The gods of this world have a claim on your life. When you sin, you've sold yourself into sin. They have a right to control you and demand from you what you have done when you broke the law of God. There's only one that is able to take that payment that you have to pay and you can't pay. He pays it himself. And once he does it, he takes them into a court of law, stands before the judge, and he says to the judge, they no longer have a claim on this individual. It's been broken. And that's exactly what he does when he breaks the power of sin over our lives. The Word of God says that he took this condemnation, the charges against us, what we were guilty of, put it all on that titleless that is nailed to the cross 
And there it was displayed for the whole world to see. And it was made open for all to see. And he paid the sin debt. And canceled your guilt and condemnation. So how does he save? He saves by paying the penalty. He saves by making it possible for God to justify the sinner. And then he saves by breaking the power of sin. These are all generalizations. Each one of them can get into much detail about what's going on when it comes to the salvation of a sinner. There are some of you sitting in here this morning listening to this preacher. You think that the Christian religion is all about a bunch of stuff you believe up here. Or it's about your culture that you were born into. It's about how you were raised. It's about how that you want to live a nice, comfortable life. And that you don't want to get caught up in breaking the law and wind up in prison. And you want to have a home with your wife and your children. Some of you think that the Christian faith is no more than that. Because you do not know what it means to have the inside of your soul changed completely by the new birth. If you really believe on the Son of God. If you really accept Him into your heart and into your soul, a change is going to take place inside of you that is so much more powerful than you. You're going to realize that something great has happened inside you. And that is what drives and motivates and inspires Christians to come and gather together and say, Lord, I do not understand how you did it. But thanks be unto God, I know you did it. Something has changed inside me. And that, my dear friend, is the new birth. And until it happens to you, you'll never understand it. You'll never understand it. Let me tell you something. Before I got saved, when I was 27 years old, I was as much an agnostic and probably a lot of atheism was in my life as anybody else on this earth. I was a skeptic. I doubted everything. I didn't believe anything. I believe everybody that went to church was a bunch of hypocrites. Religion, as far as I was concerned, stunk. I had no desire for anything from God. I'm trying to tell you the truth. Before I got saved in 1973, I was an enemy of God. But that day I bowed my head and prayed a simple sinner's prayer from a heart that believed. When I raised my head back up, somebody had moved inside me that was not him there before. I'm trying to tell you, when you're saved, you're going to change. Amen. There's a change that takes place. And thanks be unto God, it's a permanent change. Amen. I'm not a Christian one year and then the next year I decide I'm not a believer. It doesn't work that way. If you ever do become a real believer in Christ, He will transform you from a child of hell into a child of God. Amen. The Bible has some pictures of redeemed sinners. I want to give some of them to you. Let's start with Jonah, for example. He was swallowed by a whale. Jonah cried out in chapter number 2 and he said, The seaweed and these bars have wrapped themselves around me. I'm like a man locked up in a prison. And my dear friend, that's what it's like to be if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like a man locked up in a prison with the bars in front of you and you can't get out. It's like you want to change. It's like you'd like to have a difference in your life. It's like you realize that your life is in a spiral downward. You realize that it's not the way it, that you want it. It's sure not what you expected. But you're, there's nothing you can do about it. You're locked into where you are. You ever felt that way? There's a lot of people that feel that way. There's a lot of people when you try to witness to them that they feel hopeless. And they do not feel at all like there's anything God can do to change them. Some of them have tried to change their lives. They've turned over a new leaf. We've got a lot of that's going to happen in the next few days. New Year's resolutions. Well, my dear friend, I don't make New Year's resolutions. Since 1973, God gave me a new man. And that hadn't changed one bit. But there are those that feel like that they are locked in behind the bars. But then, my dear friend, you meet somebody like Robert Gibson, who spent over 30 years in prison. 
and he had a prayer missionary that came by his cell. And when that missionary first Donnie, Donnie Moore, when he first came by his cell, he tried to talk to him about the Lord. Well, Robert Gibson didn't want to hear anything he had to say. But this man of God stayed faithful and kept going back and going back and going back. And eventually he his hardness began to break. And the word of God got into his heart. And he got saved by the grace of God. And Robert Gibson is not the same man he used to be. They closed down Brushy Prison, Brushy Mountain Prison. And then they opened it back up again. And they're gonna and they're gonna make moonshine or liquor or beer or something down there. And they had an opening ceremony and people came in and they invited Robert Gibson because he was a former inmate down there in the prison. Big mistake. <laughs> Big mistake. So they invite him in. And so what does he do? He does what he always does. He started preaching and witnessing and talking to the people about the Lord. And when he told them about his time in prison, you know, they wanted to hear about his time in prison. And so when he started telling them about his time in prison, he had to tell them about when he got saved. And boy, that was just too much for them. That was not what they wanted. They wanted a nice little historical narrative and this and that. Keep it all, keep it real, keep it clean. But they didn't want to hear somebody get up and preach the gospel. But he got to preach it. And preach it he did. Do you know why? I've never been locked up behind bars like that, have you? I've never had, I've never spent 30 years locked up in some prison like that, have you? But I'll tell you right now, he knows what it's like to be locked up and he knows what it is to get out. He knows what it is to be saved. And I'll tell you something about that. He did it for him. He can do it for you. I don't know who you are. You may be right now in a prison bar, in a prison cell listening to this preacher. I want to give you some hope. You can be saved. And you can come out of that prison. You can be made free. Christ died for all men. He tasted death for murderers. He tasted death for rapists. He tasted death for every man. And he can save your soul. Amen. Then there's a picture of Rahab in the Old Testament. Rahab was saved from destruction because they destroyed the walls of Jericho came falling down. Destruction, my dear friend, is the lot for an awful lot of people in sin. Have you ever drive through some of the parts of town, of the town that you're living in right here in Knoxville? You wouldn't have to drive over just a few miles from this building. And you'll see stuff piled up in the yards. You'll see kids out there running around barefoot. You'll see hungry kids. You'll see homes. that. Then why? Because of dope and sin and destruction that's destroying their very lives. Amen. I grew up poor. I know what it is to be poor. I understand all. How many of you in this house know what I'm talking about? I mean, you know what it is to be poor. And God has blessed me beyond measure. How could, you, how could I say to you this morning how much God has blessed me and how good He's been to me? He's been very good to me. But I can identify with people who feel downtrodden, who feel like there is no hope, who feel like that, all, that, that everything's against them, who feel like there's nothing they can do to change their lot. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. When Rahab the harlot made a covenant with these men, they said, you put a scarlet thread in your window, and when I see that scarlet thread, I will pass by you. And they did. And they stuck to their word. And Rahab the harlot was saved and so was her whole family. They were all saved. Have you ever been to Skid Row? Do you know what Skid Row looks like? Have you ever been to people who they, they're homeless? A lot of homeless people? A lot of homeless people are homeless for a lot of different reasons. A lot of different reasons cause people to become homeless. Sometimes it's sickness. And they have no way to pay for medical bills. Sometimes they lose their job. They can't get another job. Sometimes it's a breakup of a family. And the home is broken. Sometimes it's a wayward child and it bankrupts the family. Sometimes they get hurt in church. And that happens to people. Every imaginable thing happens to people that are homeless. Don't ever make the mistake of classifying them all together. And saying they're all the same because they're not. People are individuals. 
But I'm going to tell you something right now. There's not a homeless person on this earth. There's not a homeless person in this country that the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't love and He can save and He can bring them out of there and He can give them a home and a job and change their life completely. Amen. The Samaritan leper. I like this one. We're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? Where are the nine? The Samaritan returned to give glory to God for what he'd done for him. He came back to thank him for what he'd done for him. You want, to, you want to give you the acid test today of your spirituality? Do you really want to know how spiritual you are? It's not the, it's not the, it's not the noise you make. No, no, no. They, they, you know the old saying is that an empty wagon makes more noise than a full one. It's okay to make noise. It's all right to shout. It's all right to praise God. Everybody's an individual. And I have no problem at all with people glorifying God. But I'm going to tell you how to measure your spirituality. And you can measure it in a heartbeat. How, preacher? How thankful are you? How thankful are you? I mean, how are you really thankful? Are you really thankful? When you walk into that house and you look at that wife or that husband and those children, are you thankful to God? Are you thankful that you can get up tomorrow morning and you can go to work and you can work a job and make an income? Are you thankful? Are you thankful that you're saved today? You're born again. Your name's in the book of life. You're not going to hell. Are you thankful? God's been good to us. He's been good to me. Thankful, unthankful. And here we have 10 lepers that are healed. I cannot in my mind imagine what it would be like to be healed of leprosy and not even care enough to go back and thank the one that did it. I can't imagine that. But you know what happened when he went back to thank him? He got more than healing. They always do. He got more. You'll know if you follow on to know the Lord. If you want to draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. I'm not talking about giving Him lip service. If you really want more of God, there's more of God. Oh, yes, there is. It can get scary at times. But I'm going to tell you something right now. There's nothing boring about God. If you're a bored Christian, you're bored with religion. And you're bored with yourself. You'll never get bored with God. Draw an eye to him. Like this brother said here, start reading his word. Start reading his word. Read his word and pray. Find your place. If you want to make a New Year's resolution, make that one. Then I'm going to start praying every day. Whether I feel like it or not, I'm going to read God's word. You see, lifestyles and habits have a way of dragging us down. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. How many of you have, not, you know, don't answer, you know, don't answer just because everybody else is, but how many of you in this house today have finally discovered that God's good? He can't be anything but good. Have you discovered that yet? He's a good God. Yes, he is. The old southerners used to call him the good Lord. You're in a bunch of them out of Georgia and Alabama and places like that in Mississippi down in there. You hear them, they say, the good Lord, the good Lord. They talk about the good Lord. He's the good Lord. Yes, he is. He's the good Lord. And then the picture of redeemed sinners, that one of the demoniac of Gadara. Just imagine he used to be the governor of Judea. Imagine one time that he had a, he had a court about him and he was an educated man and he had money. Just imagine that here at one time the man was... He had reached, the, he had reached the, the zenith. He'd reached the pinnacle. He was as high as a human being could get. But for whatever reason, and we don't know the reason, he wound up demon-possessed in a graveyard. That's what you got here. The demoniac of Gadara, howling at night, running about cutting himself, naked. And he's demon-possessed. Do you know anybody demon-possessed? The church ought to have enough sense to know demonism when they see it. Everybody that's spiritual is not spiritual by the Holy Ghost. There's a lot of unholy ghosts out there, folks. Believe me. Well, they talk about the Lord. Sure, they can talk about the Lord. So did Simon the sorcerer. Oh, yeah, they can do this. They can. Sure, they can do all kinds of stuff. But you've got to have discernment. When you're dealing with spirits, you have to understand that they'll, they'll talk the talk 
and they'll appear to be what, they, what, they, what they're not just to get in and put their hooks into you. And they'll put their hooks in you. Believe me, they will. Well, how do you know who they are? By their fruit. Not by what they profess to believe, not what they sing, not what they preach, by their fruit. If the people around you and the people that you come in contact with always seem to be in turmoil or in stressed out or marriages are being broken up or people are just losing their faith or they're, 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 getting, they're, getting, they're getting fleshly and worldly, could it be that that's the kind of spirit you've got? Even though that spirit confesses that Jesus is the Christ? Even though that spirit is a Bible thumping, quoting, a, a fundamentalist? But the fruit of the Holy Ghost is gentleness, peace, goodness, long-suffering. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. In other words, with my life touches your life. If you come in contact with my life, you should not leave Preacher Lawson stressed out. You shouldn't leave me feeling like that you've, been, you've been sifted. You shouldn't leave me feeling like, like you're condemned. When my life touches your life, you should definitely feel like the Holy Ghost is there and has blessed you. This is what the fellowship of the saints is about. We draw, draw strength from each other because we have the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, whichever way you want to say it. There's a reason for the different translations in each case. There's a good reason for it, but I don't get into all that. But Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, same, same. What is your life doing to the lives of other people? All I knew was a dogfight growing up. Busted beer bottles. I thought that was life. I thought that was normal. I was raised up around a bunch of insane, I don't know what you call them. When I got saved in 1973, that's when I came to my senses. <laughs> and I feel for kids. Yeah, I do. I feel for kids. If you want to get if you want to get on my wrong side, you start messing with children. Don't have any patience. There's Jeremiah in the pit. A pit. David said you brought me up out of an horrible pit. An unsaved man sometimes feels like he's in a pit. A pit. I'm locked up. I'm in a pit. I'm in a hole. Everybody's better than me. Everybody's above me. I'm down here in this hole. And then there's this last one. Picture of the redeemed sinner. Imagine in your mind walking out through a desert. You're in a desert and you hear a baby cry. You think, what in the world is a baby doing out here in a desert? And you come upon this little child and you see a little child lying there in the desert in its own blood. Little child lying in its own blood. And you look at that and you think to yourself, my, who would do such a thing as that? Then the voice of God. He speaks to that child, speaks to it. And he says to that child lying in its own blood, live. That's all he did. Live. He commanded it to live. That's exactly the case of every unsaved person on this earth. You are helpless. In your arrogance, you refuse to believe. In your arrogance, you refuse to repent. In your arrogance, you refuse the gospel of Christ. That's your arrogance. That's your rebellion. You rebel against God. God says that you need to be saved and that you are completely helpless. He says you're helpless. There's nothing you can do to change your condition. Religion tries to fill the void. It tries to come in its place. Everything else tries to. Education, philosophy. That's a big one with some people. And it comes in and it tries to take the place of the fact that the Holy Spirit says unto you, you're helpless. 
and you're lost. And I came to save you. It's a simple message. If you'll come this morning and you'll say, Lord Jesus, I believe everything the Bible says to believe, but I want salvation. I want saving grace. I want to be born again. What do I got to do inside my soul and inside my heart to receive you? I've prayed the sinner's prayer a dozen times. It never changed me. All I did was pray a prayer, though. That doesn't change you. Getting saved, being born again is not about praying prayers. Being born again is about receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. Taking hold of him in your heart. Clinging to him. Crying out to him. Believing on him. If you're willing to do that, you'll get up from there and you'll be a changed person. And it'll never change the rest of your life. You'll be the same, born again by the grace of God. Father, in Jesus' name. I pray you'd use this. I pray for the folks who heard your message. Never soul in this house. Thy name I pray. Amen. Let's stand up this morning.